Welcome to EPG Patshala. We are going to discuss the module on Henry James's novel, The Bostonians. But before I start talking about the novel, I think it's very important for us to know a few things about Henry James. Henry James, you must understand, is somebody who is truly a stylist. Now, what do I mean by that? He is somebody who definitely introduced a new form of fiction writing in American literature. And you could very well say that with Henry James, we certainly have the development or certainly um, the further sophistication of the kind of fiction that uh, had begun towards the middle of the 19th century. That is to say, fiction in which um, human psychology plays a very, very important part. Now, what happens by the time we come to Henry James is that human psychology absolutely takes center stage. So, if you are looking at Henry James's novels for a good story, then you are going to be disappointed because his novels are not about good stories. Um, the plots are not interesting in themselves. Not much happens. So, if you are looking for novels in which a lot of things happen, then you should not read Henry James. However, you should read Henry James in order to understand um, a very careful, a very sophisticated, um, and a very, very cautious uh, attempt at understanding how the human mind works. It should also be mentioned that Henry James's elder brother, William James, was uh, a psychologist. So therefore, there is um, an enormous amount uh, of psychological uh, sort of sophistication in the way in which Henry James shapes his characters and the way in which shapes his novels. Where are Henry James's novels set? They are primarily urban. They are primarily cosmopolitan. They happen in urban centers, as indeed the novel's title proves that this particular novel is set in Boston. Now, Boston, you must understand, is, is a part of New England. So, therefore, there is a lot of old world European sophistication that is already there. So, we are looking at sophisticated, well-read, upper-class people, urban. Um, and that is the milieu that Henry James himself was from. He was very, very comfortable in that sort of milieu. And when he wrote about other countries, they were also centers, other cities, they were also centers of sophistication of art. Um, so, for example, Paris is a very important uh, character in at least one of Henry James's novels. And we look at the way in which Henry James, in looking at a certain class of people, because that is very clear which class of people he's talking about, urban, upper class, well-educated, sophisticated, when he looks at these people, there is a, a certain, there is a certain depth of gaze. There is a certain depth of analysis. There is a certain depth of understanding that he brings to the plots and to the characters, not so much the plots, but very much the characters. And I think that is really where Henry James scores very, very highly. What we really are going to also try to understand is what exactly is it that Henry James is trying to do with fiction as a genre? What is he bringing to fiction that wasn't there before? Is he trying to use fiction to delve further and further into the human mind than had ever been attempted before? So therefore, as we start to discuss the Bostonians, we are going to keep this in mind. We should also keep in mind certain other aspects of the novel. That is to say, this is perhaps one of the novels in which Henry James is very clearly acknowledging the socio-political milieu of Boston at that time. And most importantly, he is interested in the feminist movement. So the suffragist movement of Boston is something that uh, Henry James treats at great length. Perhaps not very favorably, because when the novel was published, a lot of people of Boston were extremely angry at the way in which um, some people felt Henry James was actually caricaturing the uh, feminists of Boston. But having said that, there is a clear attempt on the part of Henry James to engage with the feminist movement, even if not entirely favorably. But that is something that we shall come to in the quest, uh, in, in the rest of our discussion. As we move on, 
we are going to find out a little bit about Henry James's uh, Henry James as as the as the man, and we are going to find some little information about him. He was an American, but towards the end of his life, he of course became a British citizen. He was born in New York, um, and he is clearly regarded as one of the key figures uh, also of 19th century literary realism. His first published work was a review of a stage performance, Miss Maggie Mitchell in Fanshawe the Cricket, published in 1863. About a year later, The Tragedy of Error, his first short story, was published. James's first payment was for an appreciation of Sir Walter Scott's novels written for the North American Review. He wrote fiction and non-fiction pieces for The Nation and Atlantic Monthly, in 1870, he published his first novel, Watch and Ward. He was nominated thrice for the Nobel Prize in Literature, 1911, 1912, and 1916. The writing career of Henry James was one of the most productive and most influential in American literary history. He wrote 20 novels, 112 tales, 12 plays, 7 volumes of travel and criticism, and a great deal of literary journalism in his 51-year writing period. Among James's most famous literary works are The Europeans, Daisy Miller, Washington Square, The Bostonians, the novel that we are going to discuss today, and The Turn of the Screw. The Turn of the Screw I would want you to make particular note of because we were discussing the Gothic in the context of Edgar Allan Poe. Many people would want to regard The, the Turn of the Screw also as, as an example of the Gothic. But of course, he wrote a lot of other novels as well. Roderick Hudson, Portrait of a Lady, The Princess Kasamasima. We also have Wings of the Dove and we have The Ambassadors and not forgetting The Golden Bowl. Those of you who are interested in watching movies would want to uh, make a note of the fact that The Bostonians was actually made into a rather wonderful film in 1984, starring Christopher Reeve, Vanessa Redgrave. Um, we also have a film of Wings of the Dove. We have a film also of uh, The Golden Bowl. So a lot of his novels have actually been made into rather successful films. He wrote several um, short stories as well. Um, you can uh, enjoy them if you, if you have the time. The Beast in the Jungle is a very, very interesting novella. But then, of course, there, uh, there are other short stories such as A Tragedy of Error, um, The Story of the Year. You have various other novellas like The Aspen Papers, The Pupil of 1891 uh, certainly merits mention. The Figure in the Carpet of 1896 also mentions, also deserves a mention, as indeed does Madame de Mauve. Moving on, we now also talk a little bit about certain plays that Henry James wrote. Although Henry James is certainly not known as, as a playwright, but he did certainly try his hand at, at writing theatre, writing plays. And I would only want to mention Guy Domville uh, of 1895. I would want to mention The High Bid of 1907 and The Outcry of 1911. Henry James also made an enormous contribution to literary criticism. Um, and of course, his book, The Art of Fiction in 1884, is well worth looking at, as indeed are other works such as The Nobel School of Fiction, The American Scene, which is about travel writing, and of course, some autobiography, such as Notes of a Son and Brother, and of course, A Small Boy and others. When one starts to talk about Henry James's writing style, I think what one has to again remember is that uh, for an American who is writing, his writing is incredibly European. So one could very well argue that Henry James was perhaps going counter to the project that had been set up during the American Renaissance, which is to say, let us explore a kind of writing that is going to be uniquely American. Uh, Henry James's fiction reads very, very European. There is a certain sophistication, there is a certain um, sort of savoir faire, there is a certain uh, acknowledgement of, of high culture, which is something um, perhaps not terribly American in itself, because American literature kind of valorizes open spaces, it valorizes agrarian culture, it valorizes physical labor, as um, we can see if we look at 
if I randomly pick a novel, if you look at um, Old Man and the Sea, where there is great emphasis and there is a great validization on physical labor. But the labor that we find in Henry James's novels is very much intellectual labor. Here, people think a lot. Um, they think about themselves, they think about their feelings, they think about others. So there is a vast amount of psychological exercise that is constantly afoot. His method of writing from a character's point of view allowed him to explore issues related to consciousness, perception. His style in the later works has been compared to impressionistic painting. So all in all, I think one could very well say that Henry James's brand of fiction is really not of great value if you are simply looking for plot structure. It is, however, of tremendous value if you are looking at the way in which a character is built up, not from the outside, but from the inside. How a character's consciousness is shaped, that is really where Henry James's power lies. It is also noticed that his writing, he has increasingly abandoned direct statement in favor of frequent double negatives, complex descriptive imagery, single paragraphs um, run for page after page, in which an initial noun uh, is succeeded by pronouns surrounded by clouds of adjectives and pre prepositional clauses, far from their original reference, and verbs would be deferred and then preceded by a series of adverbs. So the reason why I'm mentioning all of this is because you should be alert to the way in which Henry James is doing something rather interesting. He's playing with language. This, I think, is a very important aspect of literature that I think we should always remind ourselves, which is literary writing is not like any other kind of writing. There is a distinct difference between the way in which literature is written and the way in which, for example, journalism is written. When a journalist writes copy, they are basically trying to use words in their conventional sense. They are trying to construct conventional sentences, sentences that are easy to read, sentences that are easy to understand, sentences and meanings that are familiar to everybody. The novelist's work is completely different. What the novelist is trying to do is the novelist is challenging language. The novelist is pushing the boundaries of language. The novelist is constantly trying to push the boundaries of meaning of particular words. And that is something which I think you can certainly find in Henry James. Because he's trying to understand exactly how a sentence is constructed. Can he do it differently? Can he use adjectives, adverbs, nouns, pronouns in a different way? Can he break up clauses? So he really does experiment with form. He experiments form not only at the basis of the overall form of fiction, but certainly also on the form of how sentences are constructed. So here is a person who is doing a lot of experimentation at almost, um, at, at almost a micro level, really, as far as the choice of words is concerned, as far as the construction of sentences are concerned. The Bostonians was uh, published in uh, as a serial in the Century magazine between 1885 and 1886 and then as a three volume novel in February 1886. He tried to convey what was going on at that time. Um, a very large part of the novel also deals with the civil war and something that he for the first time and for the last time I think tries to talk about is lesbianism. Now lesbianism was not discussed openly in, in Victorian culture and Henry James clearly belonged to such a Victorian culture. Um, and so therefore when the Bostonians was uh, published um, there was a lot of outcry and a lot of people were quite horrified by the suggestions that are being made in the novel. Remember that lesbianism is not openly represented in the novel, but there are enough suggestions to suggest that there is perhaps um, lesbian attachment happening, at least on the part of one of the characters. Um, and it is as a result of this that the term Boston marriage becomes rather uh, common, but we will come to that later. Something that I think we should also register is that um, the novel sometimes has a rather satirical tone. And this is something which that the Bostonians did not take to very kindly. They felt that Henry James was making fun of them. Um, and so there was a lot of um, reaction, rather the negative reaction to the novel because they felt that the Henry James was looking at Bostonians in, in a rather unfavorable light. As you can well imagine, the novel was a commercial flop and James never set another novel in America after that. 
The novel is set in Boston and in New York, uh, and it clearly reflects some of the contemporary impressions of the nation that Henry James formed. The novel includes some rather touching reflections on the Civil War, which had only concluded 20 years before, but its principal subject matter is what is normally called the woman question or the women's question, conflicts between traditional view of the role of women in society and the view of suffragists and what today we would call supporters of women's liberation. So therefore, Henry James is here dealing with uh, the kind of politics uh, which is very public, which is played out in a public space, but he is also using uh, this particular uh, idea, the idea of women's liberation, to also draw certain characters who think that there is a very, 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 very thin line between the private and the public. And that is really what I think Henry James is rather interested in, is to how much or to what extent does our public life influence our private life or vice versa? How much does our private life influence our public life? And um, what exactly is political? Is the political the private? Is the personal the political? And these are the questions that Henry James certainly puts in the novel. If I have to give you a very quick summary, um, see this is the thing about the Henry James novel, is that the novels can be summarized very quickly because the plot is very thin. There isn't much action going on. We can think about the Bostonians, it has been described as a tragic comedy. It has been described as a tragic comedy because of course this is a novel that is both tragic and comic. So there are parts where uh, that are very very painful to read but then there are other parts that are actually rather funny. And in this novel, there are basically three characters. There is Basil Ransom, a political conservative from Mississippi. There is Olive Chancellor, Basin's, uh, Ransom's uh, cousin, and a Boston feminist. And there is Verena Tarrant, who is a pretty young girl and who is also a member of the feminist movement with Olive. Now here, I would want you to be aware of what is sometimes called the triangulation of desire, um, or you may also know about this as the love triangle. That is to say, there is one person who is the object of emotions, or object of affection for two people. There are many, many films that deal with this, that what exactly happens when one person becomes the object of affection of two people because according to the rules of society, only two people can fall in love with each other. So what happens when two people are falling in love with each other, but not with each other, but falling in love with a third person? How does this work? So we are talking about the triangulation of desire over here. Now what happens in the novel is that we find Ransom and Olive, they are both developing affection towards Verena Tarrant. So what we really trace through the novel is that ultimately who is going to get the love of Verena Tarrant. That is really the, the emotional focus. Basil Ransom hails from Mississippi, as I told you. He's a lawyer. He's a Civil War veteran. He's visiting his Olive, uh, his, his Chancellor Olive, uh, his uh, cousin Olive Chancellor in Boston. And Olive is one of the leading figures of the feminist movement in Boston. Olive takes him to a meeting where there's another young woman, Verena Tarrant, who delivers a speech on feminism. Now, you have to understand that Ransom is politically conservative. So therefore, he does not support the feminist movement. So he is not very pleased with what Verena Tarrant has to say. But however, he's absolutely fascinated by Verena Tarrant's voice by Verena Tarrant's beauty. So he does not agree with Verena Tarrant politically, but he's certainly attracted to Verena Tarrant, uh, Verena Tarrant as, as a person. But towards the end of the novel, what really happens is that Olive arranges for a speech. This is going to be a big public speech for Verena or Verana, and Ransom reaches the venue before the speech begins with the intention to elope with Verana. And this public lecture has possibly career-defining implications for her because Olive wants Verena, Verana to become a full-time feminist. She spots Basil before she walks out onto the stage. She's disoriented. Her well, his well-meaning surprise ultimately unravels everything. She's too rattled to give her speech. She cancels the speech on the spot, which outrages everyone in the audience, implying a disgraceful end to her career. But 
what we really need to focus on over here is the character of Olive Chancellor a little bit. Now, what do we make of Olive Chancellor? She is one of the three main protagonists of the novel. She is presented in the novel as a champion of feminism and as an active member of the post-Civil War feminist movement in Boston. She is also presented, one would suspect, as a lesbian because her attraction towards Verana is very, very clear. She is seen in the novel trying to win Verana, just as Ransom Basil, her cousin, is also attracted to her. So Verana, therefore, is sort of torn, as it were, between Olive on the one side and Basil on the other. Um, what does one have to say about Verena Tarrant? Talent? Now, she is Olive's protege. She is an attractive young woman. She possesses few ideas of her own, but is groomed for the cause of women's suffrage movement. She is also a member of the feminist movement and delivers speeches in support of women's rights. But Basil Ransom falls in love with her and she also feels attraction towards him. At the end of the novel, it is seen that Olive arranges one public speech for Verana, but of course that speech is cancelled and um, we, we are left in, in sort of some doubt, but we are more or less sure that actually uh, Miss Tarrant is going to go with Basil and not with Olive. So if we come to the end of the novel, we find that uh, the novelist's sympathy uh, is perhaps with Olive, who is left alone. Basil Ransom's character, I think, is rather interesting because he is somebody who is regarded as um, conservative, in his opinions, uh, and he also is the embodiment of the South. Here I think one needs to talk a little bit about the cultural difference between the East Coast and the southern part of, of America, because there seems to be a huge cultural divide between the East Coast of America and the Southern United States, because the East Coast of America always considers itself to be politically much more progressive than the South. This is something, and this particular impression has lasted into the present day, where people of the East Coast of America still pride themselves on their uh, political progressiveness, and they constantly hold the Southern United States responsible for being politically regressive. So in this case, we find that Basil Ransom, to a large extent, represents uh, that South, which is conservative, represents the South that is absolutely not in favor of the feminist movement. So therefore, Basil Ransom becomes the embodiment of Southern conservatism. Now, the great um, sort of question in the novel, of course, is um, who does uh, Verena ultimately go to? Now, this is something which we really, this is, this can be looked at also as Verena being torn between two ideologies. So, Olive and Basil, therefore, are not individuals in themselves. They represent two different ideologies. Olive represents a more egalitarian feminist ideology, whereas Basil represents a more conservative and therefore patriarchal ideology. So therefore, um, it is rather interesting to see these two characters as embodying two ideologies that are completely opposed to each other. The sadness lies in the fact that if one reads uh, the novel through the end, that it seems to be that Verena is ultimately um, the moving towards Basil. So therefore, there seems to be a victory of, of conservatism and therefore a defeat of the feminist movement and of, of feminism as such. There are, of course, uh, apart from Olive Chancellor, a couple of other characters as well. Um, I would want to talk about Mrs. Farage. Now, Mrs. Farage is also involved in the suffragette movement. They, uh, Olive and Mrs. Farage, they're both more concerned with social control mechanism and feeding their own egos than genuine concern for women as individuals. So over here, I think uh, Henry James is being rather critical because he is rather suspicious of what what some feminists are doing in the sense that he is wondering whether there are some women within the feminist movement who are perhaps using the movement for their own personal benefit uh, 
and not so much for greater good. But this negative image is of course balanced by the, by the characters of Dr. Prance and Miss Birdseye. Dr. Prance is a professional young woman who puts her ego to one side in pursuit of her interest in medicine and science. And Miss Birdseye has a life of history of genuine devotion to the cause. She has campaigned in the South for the abolition of slavery. As I have told you before, the Civil War casts a rather large shadow in the novel. There is a Civil War museum that, that also occurs in the novel. And we have to understand that when Basil Ransom, uh, when we look at Basil Ransom, we should also remember that his family lost their property because of the war. Uh, there are a number of instances in the novel where the discussion of southern people and northern people, southern states and northern states have been mentioned. So there is a character in, you know, when I was referring to Miss Birdseye, well, who was also involved in the anti-slavery movement. So the, the Civil War casts a fairly long shadow over the novel and that is something that I think we should take note of. I think what this really has happened is that we are now looking therefore at the way in which this entire novel um, asks certain very basic fundamental questions about the ways in which Henry James is trying to look at his own society. As I had told you towards the beginning that what Henry James is really trying to do in most of his novels is to look within the, the soul of the characters. His novels are characterized by remarkable insights, psychological insights into people and the way in which they think, the way in which people behave. But in this case, I think Henry James is also talking about a public movement. So he's trying to understand exactly where is it that the private and the public, they meet um, and when they meet, is it a reconciliation of the private and the public or is it a conflict between the private and the public? These are some of the questions that Henry James certainly asks. I would not be able to finish this discussion if I don't talk about the concept of the Boston marriage. Now, what do we understand by the Boston marriage? This is something which was quite common um, at that time, but quite common in the sense that a lot of women were getting into such relationships and there are some rather remarkable examples of this. Please let us not forget that Henry James's um, own sister, perhaps, was, was involved in such a Boston marriage. What exactly do we mean by the Boston marriage? Well, a Boston marriage is, is a relationship or it is a living arrangement, as it were, where two women choose to live with each other and they live with each other they are um, and they are uh, financed as it were by themselves that is to say that they don't have to turn to any man for their sustenance for their livelihood they earn their own money they are not dependent on any men um, and here are there are several rather famous examples ladies of langochlan for example is a rather remarkable example of two women who live together as a family without getting married. So therefore, there isn't the social sanction of marriage, but there is certainly uh, a kind of marriage that seems to work between these two women, which is why we have the term Boston marriage, uh, because a lot of women in Boston, those who thought themselves as feminists were doing this. Uh, and we find uh, the two uh, women characters, the two central women characters, that is to say Olive Chancellor uh, and Miss Tarrant, they also seem to be entering into some kind of a Boston marriage. That is certainly something that Olive Chancellor wants, because she absolutely wants there to be that kind of an arrangement between her and Miss Tarrant. If we look at the Boston marriage in a slightly more detailed way, then we might find that this is perhaps a way in which women were beginning to carve out relationships that are outside of the purview of patriarchy. They were perhaps saying that in order for us to have emotionally fulfilled lives, we don't necessarily need the men. So there was a very strong feminist message that was being sent out by women who were entering the Boston marriage. Um, we don't know about Henry James's opinion of it, but as far as this novel is concerned, it is fairly clear to it was fairly clear that Henry James was probably ambivalent about it. Perhaps there was a part of him that supported it because there is clear sympathy towards Olive Chancellor, but then um, the, the sympathy towards Olive Chancellor only develops, remember, after Olive is left 
alone. So therefore, Henry James is uh, full of pity for Olive when she is alone, when she is forsaken, when she is lonely. But when she was with uh, Miss Tarrant, then I think, or at least definitely towards the earlier part of the novel, she is uh, not uh, presented very favorably. So we we think that there is some kind of a dichotomy in Henry James's attitude towards the, the figure of Olive Chancellor. In conclusion, I would simply want to say that when we read The Bostonians, we have to understand that this is a rather unique novel because this is a novel that manages to combine both. It combines tremendous psychological um, sort of insights into the way in which people think, the way in which they conduct their relationships, the way in which they think about themselves. But this is combined with a very, very important public movement, that is to say the feminist movement. So Henry James is trying to look at the feminist movement not only as, as a public phenomenon, but he's also trying to look at the deeper personal repercussions that this movement is going to have. Thank you.